Hello everyone, this is Deborah Dudak. I'm a board member with the Illinois State Historical Society and welcome to our very first History Happy Hour. Now due to the way that Halloween is following this year, we're recording this session. However, we would like to encourage you to like, to subscribe and to share this video with your friends and family or anybody who's interested in history in general. We're accepting new members for this year and remember that Illinois State Historical Society memberships make a great gift as we're coming up to the gift giving season. Um, but we want you to sit back and enjoy this presentation on stories in stone decoding, uh, decoding the sentiment behind cemetery symbolism and is by far one of my favorite subjects, but also one of my most asked for presentations when I'm out on the lecture circuit. So today we're gonna to take a look at a variety of headstones uh, from time within the United States, not just if in Illinois, but also across the country as there's some similarities and then some pretty local, uh, pretty local stones that are specific just here to Illinois. And you can remember at any time, you're more than welcome to donate to the Illinois State Historical Society. Throwing us a couple bucks goes a long way to making sure that we can bring really, really great programs and provide really, really great services to historians and to the public across the state. Um, so let's get going. So what we're going to look at today is what do we think of when someone says cemetery? Now, for the most time, I think people watch a little too many movies or too many television shows that cemeteries are these dark, creepy places that are surrounded by these creepy, gross looking headstones and that the, the cemetery itself should be something to be ignored or something that you just hold your breath as you're running by. And that's really not the case. Our relationship with cemeteries has actually changed quite a bit throughout history, uh, but more commonly what we see in the United States as cemeteries, not only as a place um, to mourn are the people who have passed, but also as an open green space or an open park space uh, that people can walk around and enjoy and also kind of get a feel for history. We've seen that a lot right now with the current pandemic that's happening where more and more people are walking around outside and one of the places that they can go and enjoy nature and enjoy being outside site uh, with maybe fewer people around is their local cemetery. Um, so we always tell people to be respectful of whatever cemetery you're in. Um, and at the time, please don't do anything to damage the headstones or to otherwise uh, be disrespectful to the people that are buried there. Uh, but cemeteries are a really great place to go and just observe history as it as we uh, move forward into time. Now for today, what we look at when we see cemeteries, what are we most likely to see besides the dark, decrepit, horrible looking cemeteries we see in movies and in television, you're actually gonna see a lot of variants and you're also going to see a lot of different types of headstones, um, things that are very mass market produced, things that you can pick up today um, on the uh, right of your screen, but also something that's more specialized um, like the SpongeBob figurine that's over on the left. Uh, but you're also going to find a lot of what we consider uh, marble headstones or porous marble headstones those white headstones that seem to be melting under the rain, you're gonna see a lot of those um, as you're going through some of your cemeteries. But let's go on a virtual tour. So let's go through a, let's go through a theoretical cemetery of just somewhere amazing. And let's walk through the evolution of cemetery and cemetery symbolism on, on a virtual tour. And we're gonna start in the oldest section of our virtual cemetery. We're going to take a look at headstones from around 1560 to 1920. Now your average cemetery may not have headstones that go back to 1560, at least not here in Illinois and basically not in a lot of places um, uh, outside of the original 13 colonies of the United States. Uh, but you know, there you might have a few uh, that are maybe a little bit later than that. Uh, but we're definitely gonna work from that earlier time period all the way through 1920 and then go from 1920 onward. So a lot of our early headstones, um, especially the ones that you'll see in, in New England um, or in the mid-Atlantic states, a lot of these early, early headstones have a lot of this sculpture that a lot of people would would uh, would basically kind of compare to um, a, a skulled wing or like a gothic influence. A lot of the symbolism that you're seeing are items that are used to 
basically frighten people onto the path of morality and temperance and good behavior. Um, a lot of the sort of skull figurines that we see, um, angels, winged death heads, um, are very, very popular and are very, very early a cemetery sculpture. Now, and they do have their influence in something called Le Grand Dance Macabre, um, which was printed, at least printed woodcut printed in the 16th century. Um, and it is in multiple languages. You can go on Internet Archive or Google Books and you can find copies of this and, and look at them today. Um, this happens to be a French version, uh, which is the version that I tend to consult a little bit more. But this actually kind of sees uh, death as that uh, skeletal figure. And we inherit that from the Great Plague. Um, so the Great Plague that was sweeping through uh, Europe. Um, in the late medieval period and just kind of wiping people out all over the place. And the plague isn't just once, it's multiple times throughout history that you'll see the plague coming and going um, into, into different areas and different pockets of time. Uh, but death hath promised to come and he will indeed. So it means that death is coming for you. Doesn't really matter who you are, what time period you're dealing with. Um, if you're rich, you're poor, you're high status, you're low status, doesn't matter death is coming for you. And that symbolism of that winged death head is where we start to kind of see that's the origins of that winged death head is from these, uh, these, these, uh, the artwork that comes out of the, the plague period. So when you're looking through headstones uh, from the 16th and 17th century, that a lot of the symbolism, because it does have a Puritan based influence as well, where Puritans were not looking for a lot of religious symbolism in their headstones or in their markers. So they want to scare people onto the path of the straight and narrow. A lot of your themes and your cemetery symbolism from this time period is going to take place um, having some very hush religious overtones um, or something that is more of the Freemason um, Freemason variety. So you do have the winged death head. You do have a crown and ewer, uh, bookshelves and a tree on some some uh, some stones. A lot of those have an ancient connotation in Christianity. So uh, those are themes that you sometimes will see, especially crowns. We keep crowns around for a really long time. They've been with us. Um, for uh, in cemetery symbolism throughout history. Um, so, but we're also looking to that Masonic and fraternal uh, symbols are also very popular from this time period. So when you start to look at uh, what's on our headstones, remember that a lot of the stone or the type of stone is gonna depend on what was locally available to be quarried. Amazon is not in existence. You can't click add to cart. Sears Roebuck is nowhere in sight. Um, so you have to rely on the local stone mason to, to grab your stone or to quarry your stone, bring it back, um, to spend the money to have this carved. And so it's not unusual to have multiple people buried underneath one stone and that these burials are going to take place in a local churchyard. Now, Chicago is a pretty good example of this, that yes, we, we did not have cemeteries dating back to the 1560s, but what we did have were communal burial grounds in places like Lincoln Park. And Lincoln Park became so overgrown and, and so many people were being buried there that it became a health hazard. And eventually at some point they had to uh, disinter everybody from those cemeteries and reinter them outside of the city, which even today Chicago, to my understanding, um, does not have a burial ground within uh, downtown Chicago itself. So we do see a little bit of that uh, overcrowding issue uh, being a concern. Um, so when we have on our mortality symbols, we have the skull and the bones and the hourglass. Very, very typical mortality symbols of as I am, so you will be. Uh, there's the, and a lot of the things that we're seeing on this stone besides the, the stay on the right path, do the right thing, um, scare the crap out of you sort of symbolism is that you do see um, how uh, either some of the crossbones might be crossed, like what you'd see for pirates, um, or you'll often see um, death itself sometimes holding an hourglass, depending on how accurate or how great the stonemason was at carving these items. Um, so the symbolism can vary depending on the skill of the people who are performing uh, the the uh, stone work. So here's an anatomy of a winged death head. And I think this would be an amazing either sort of rock band called winged death head. I can see people going winged death head, you know, like 
it's it's a great it's a great name. We gotta have more names like Wing Death had. Um, but it is supposed to symbolize the triumph of death over life, but in a very very scary way. Um, so uh, what you'll see with the Wing Death Head is it does evolve over time. In our earlier time period, it is a skeletal face, so that's what we're getting from uh, the sim uh, the symbolism and the imagery that we and that we accumulated from the Great Plague, and then we have not only the bony face and it also not being a non-religious symbol, um, it also will have hollow eyes. So that's how you can typically tell that this is a skull, the elongated jaw, the hollow eyes, the bony face, this is a skeletal figure. And then of course you have the wings kind of, you know, uh, you know flaring out from the back. Um, as we get later into the time period, so this is a now 200 years later, so if we're starting at about 1560, this is, this is a stone from 1791, and the winged death head has given way to a winged face. Part of it is that people did like the old sim, uh, the old symbols, they did old, like the old imagery, and they still start, start bringing it, or they still try to keep it, uh, but it's becoming, uh, as people's attitudes towards death changes, and we start seeing this during the Enlightenment era quite a bit, that it's no longer a winged death head as much as it is a winged face. And you'll start seeing this somewhere around um, 1760, 1770, 1780. Um, you'll start to see these small changes. Um, but you'll also start seeing as uh, tools and skills have grown over time, you'll start to see more of a tablet-shaped marker. So you'll see a tympanium, which is at the top, the winged face in the middle, a side border, a tablet, and then a shoulder. And that's where we start seeing more of that movie, television show, Sleepy Hollow looking uh, headstones. And it's from this time period in the late 1790s. This is a, another early marker, but this is from 1801. So what we're seeing is that, yes, we have a full skeleton. Yes, absolutely. But we also have a torch and torches start to become a uh, start to become part of an imagery. This is its very infancy of at least as far as imagery on American headstones. We start to see it more in the Victorian era, but with torches slanted upside down, which means that it's a another that someone may be dead, uh, but their soul is still a light in the afterlife. A lot of this early imagery is that your candle has been put out by death. So again, so we'll, we're starting to see a little imagery that we'll see later on starting to get its starting point here. But what we also have here is an angel. We have an angel with an hourglass. So this is definitely an imagery that isn't so much about scaring people onto the straight and narrow as much as it is a uh, that death is now become this natural part of life and that when death extinguishes, there's this angel there uh, to... Uh, that there's this angel there that's going to now transition you into heaven. So it's sort of telling that story that death is a part of life and is a very, very different point of view uh, from what we had um, earlier in the last couple of centuries. So by the early 19th century, so by 1800, uh, markers are becoming taller and whiter. They're more of a straight tablet. Uh, the neoclassical themes of a weeping willow, a fraternal organization, urns, drapery, mourning figures, things that you'll see if you go on Google or eBay and type in um, mourning jewelry or mourning art or something along those lines, you'll start to see this neoclassical explosion of items because neoclassicism and its emphasis on not only nature and questioning our place in the world, but also our attitude toward death is also changing what we are seeing on cemetery symbols um, and cemetery uh, headstones from this time period. So what you'll see is a lot of weeping willows. You'll see a lot of Grecian urns because remember, we're getting throwing back to new classical period. Um, and then of course, adding more of the uh, fraternal or uh, Masonic symbols onto our headstones. And you see this in, uh, oh, what's that movie with Nicolas Cage, National Treasure. So when here, they're in this, they're not in the cemetery, but they're looking at somebody who's saying, oh yeah, he's a master mason of the third mark. You know, that's where we're kind of seeing from this time period as well. So um, another thing that I like to point out, uh, you can have combinations. It's not just required to have 
one uh, symbol on your headstone. So there typically will be two or three. And the big two that we see are typically an urn or a Grecian urn and a weeping willow. A weeping willow actually, yes, it always looks like it's perpetually weeping, but it also has a strength as far as that it's um, a resiliency to that, that tree that you can take the branches off. You can actually pluck the small little branches off and they regrow. So there is sort of a, a, a symbol there of being in perpetually in mourning um, as if you're, you're always going to be uh, remembering this person uh, with sadness that they've passed. So there's a little bit of cemetery symbolism with that too. But what you also start seeing are um, pillars coming into play. Um, so there's, the, not necessarily when I look at it and say that every headstone is going to look like these from the 1830s. Um, sometimes it's just as very simple. That's what somebody could afford is just to simply have a weeping willow. But more and more of that symmetry of neoclassicism, the pillars on both sides, the urn right in the middle, the weeping willow tree kind of uh, draping over and filling out that space. You'll see a lot of design elements in these headstones from this time period. Now, by the time we get to the mid 19th century, so about 1855 onward, allegorical themes start to replace those neoclassical symbols, which were hot for about 50 years or so. Um, you still start, you still see the old symbols. You still see the weeping willows. You still see the crowns. You still see the urns. You still see the pillars. But you're starting to also find more of the themes that we would associate today with older cemetery symbolism. So marble, of course, is going to be super popular. It's easy to carve and it's easy uh, to ship. And with advances that we start seeing in the Civil War as far as train dis or um, transportation distribution and um, more sophisticated equipment, it's going to give away uh, to different types of markers that we're going to see. But we're also going to see explosions in things like um, iron grave markers and decorative flowers becoming popular. So there's a lot of changes that we start seeing because the, because the Victorians really start putting their own stamp on this. And in a way that because they were over the top decorative, they start bringing that symbolism into their cemeteries as well. So let's take a look at some Civil War, War headstones. Now, these are just some examples. If you go into our little cemetery, our little virtual cemetery, you'll typically find an area that's a military plot or you'll see a military headstone lumped in in a family plot somewhere. That's because um, by an act of Congress after the Civil War, uh, there were burial rights or at least the ability to be buried for free and to be provided with a free headstone um, that actually starts in 1873. Um, and those are in national cemeteries. But when you're in our smaller little virtual cemetery, uh, the government starts providing these headstones in 1879 because not everybody wanted to be buried in a national cemetery. Some people wanted to be buried with their, their spouse. Some people wanted to be buried with their, their mother, their father, their grandparents, their brothers, their sisters. So Congress expanded these burial rights acts uh, into, into 1879. So you will see a difference. Um, sometimes uh, I've had some people who say Confederate headstones are angled at the top, and I have seen that. Um, and in our cemetery, it just happens to be a lot of Union soldiers because we're stereotypically, we're going to be in Illinois. Um, so so you, what you'll typically have are just rows of individuals and just know that they were receiving these headstones for free and their markings um, and that their burials were free as well. So, but not everybody who served in the Civil War had a headstone um, that matches the ones that we've just seen. So for example, here's the burial of Andrew Ingalls. And Andrew was a veteran of the Civil War. He died in 1863 of typhoid fever. So he, um, he was in Gallon, Tennessee, which is next to Nashville. And his father was a man of pretty good means. So he was able to get the permission slips needed to take the train down to pick up his son's body and then transport it back. And we, it had been a family story that he had done this, so we didn't quite have the evidence to, uh, to support that he had done this. We couldn't find any burial 
transcripts, we couldn't find any burial transit forms, you know, some of those other paperwork that comes up in history. So what we actually did was a ground penetrating radar project in this portion of the cemetery. And sure enough, there is a body there. So we are fairly confident that this is the body that Mr. Ingalls brought back. And that is the body of his son, Andrew. Now, because Andrew died in 1863, his parents bought his headstone, which is why we have so much information about him. Um, however, his parents did not go back to the government and ask for an additional headstone. If there's something that happens to this headstone at some point where it's no longer legible or it's been completely destroyed, uh, then his family or our cemetery could request a replacement stone for Andrew uh, to make sure that he always has a marker within our cemetery at all times. Now, what people, when we start looking at this era of time and we start looking at our cemetery, we start looking at the impact that the Civil War had on cemeteries as a whole. Yes, you have uh, cemeteries being established in the 1850s outside of downtown cities. Um, you start to have more of the park-like feel, more of that uh, rolling hills, pretty side lakes, pretty trees, more of a, uh, a nature, back to nature uh, environment that we start seeing in the 1850s. So, um, but the Civil War really did give us and did qu contribute quite a bit to our modern day cemeteries uh, by providing everything from military battles to, uh, I'm sorry, mi military burials to um, those headstones and the free burial services for veterans, um, but also a system for identifying the military dead uh, during the Civil War so they would know it's the right person from the right regiment, from the right unit, so they could have their headstone uh, that, was, that would later be made. Um, also ensuring that we had a reliable next of kin notification. It sounds weird, but people were really having to rely on firsthand accounts or firsthand letters from people uh, to be able to say that uh, this person died and then eventually the government started just printing lists of wounded or dead in newspapers but in this way during the civil war they would make sure uh, this would actually be the system that we would later come up that people would receive a telegram uh, that something had happened to their loved one and that they should be sent for right away um, then of course we also get the uh we also get Declaration Day or what we call Memorial Day, uh, where people would go to cemeteries, at least I did when I was a little kid, go to the cemetery, you'd clean off all of the graves, uh, you'd plant flowers, you'd do some sort of project in the cemetery and then have a picnic. Not everybody does that anymore, uh, but um, it's still something that uh, we still ce celebrate today. Now, military headstones and what people really don't understand is that the first, this is actually Arlington Cemetery. Um, Arlington Cemetery, the first headstones that were erected there were not made out of stone. They were made out of wood. They were wood panel headstones um, or as, as markers, should I say. So there is an example of one of these um, and that is on the left. Um, so we're using this as an example in our cemetery that this is a wooden uh, marker that would be later replaced by stone as the government had the funds and the ability to uh, and the ability to make those replacement markers because wood really only lasts maybe 50 years. Um, but by the time we get that funding in 1873 and 1878, now uh, we can start um, adding more of these stones to our uh, to our cemetery. Um, there's also headstones that have, that have evolved over time. So for example, we have our Civil War headstones that are over on the left. We have a replacement stone in the center for a Pfeiffer who served in the Revolutionary War. So he must have had a marker at some point. He's still covered underneath um, all of those acts of Congress. So we were able to go back, get a replacement stone, and then the local um, NSDAR, National Society for the Daughters of the American Revolution, actually placed a bronze marker in the middle of that marker that was provided by the government. And then, of course, on the uh, right, you'll see all of the different headstones that we have for individuals uh, that are no longer those upright stones, as there's a lot of cemeteries that have said, no, all the headstones need to be flat. So our, our uh, groundskeepers can just mow right over them. Um, so now you start seeing not only stone um, 
just flat stone markers, but then we also have the bronze markers. In the case of my grandfather, he has um, he has an upright stone, but then on the back he has the military issued bronze plaque. Um, so some people are starting to do that too. So you'll see military headstones go through time. I did find one for a veteran of the Toledo War, and that was really cool. If anybody knows what the Toledo War is, you get extra credit points because I did find one dude who had a headstone that said veteran of the Toledo War. So that's a totally different thing. It's not necessarily Illinois, but it's still a pretty cool war. So let's turn the corner and let's take a look into uh, those mid uh, 1850s and onward headstones. We're going to go from about 1850 to about 1920 here. And here are some popular symbols that we tend to, or modern audiences tend to equate to cemetery symbolism. So we have owls and ivy. So owls tend to be the wise bird. Remember, we're looking at some Greek symbolism here because of Athena, the goddess of wisdom, or that somebody just really liked owls. Uh, we have the doves of peace. We have the lamb of God, um, which we use a lot for uh, children's markers or for um, uh, small children, typically under the age of 12, but you do get to see them a lot more for babies that are under the age of two. Um, the sheath of wheat, which means a life well lived or a um, that I'm, I'm bringing in my harvest. So we're going to Jesus that your life is over and that you're going to Jesus and this is that final harvest. And then of course, seeing an expansion of fraternal organizations like Woodsmen of the World, we we'll start seeing more of, of those society symbols that are being available uh, for purchase. But here are a couple that I think that people kind of get confused about. So let's run through some of the symbols that maybe you've seen, but you haven't really known what they are before. This is the Alpha and Omega, the Chiro and the IHS or the IH, um, IHS or IHC. So they, you'll see these on larger markers. Sometimes there's just the two, sometimes it's all four, uh, but the alpha and omega are in the yellow. So the, remember that uh, the beginning and the end. So that's another one of those uh, early references. The second is the Chiro, which is the, um, the two letters um, for P and X. Uh, so PX is also a Latin word for Pax, which means peace. So you'll see that in the red. And then the IHS or the IHC, uh, which is a Latin abbreviation I cannot pronounce for the life of me with any straightforward face. Uh, but in this sign, you will conquer. And that's the one that looks in blue that looks like some sort of heraldry symbol. So you typically will see these sometimes by themselves, sometimes all four. Uh, but now that you'll see that a lot of these symbols have a deep, deep early Christian connotation. Um, so you'll see these as you go around and say, this is somebody who's very, very dedicated to the faith or they're really really dedicated to those older symbols and find a lot of meaning in those older symbols what i like is actually anchors so anger is a theological virtue for hope um so it does come from hebrews and that that you are god is your anchor in um in the harbor so that this is your place to find safe harbor it is an early christian symbol and somebody was running around saying if somebody has an anchor on their headstone then they were a sailor and that's funny because i've seen headstones with a, of a small child who was four that has an anchor on it i don't believe the u.s navy takes four-year-olds into their service and if they do, that's in completely dumb. So in this instance, it's not, yes, that the symbol can, anchor can in, indicate that somebody performed military service or was a, um, a merchant marine or was a ship's captain on a merchant vessel. Yes, that's completely true, uh, but it also has that connotation uh, to the theological value of hope um, and that it's a small, that, Christ is my anchor in, in, in the harbor. So in this instance, Captain Sylvester Keeney, um, he, was a, uh, he was a ship's captain. You can see it by his spyglass as well. So this makes perfect sense that he would have an anchor. A four-year-old, it's, uh, it's a different symbol and a different value. Um, books pop up a lot, and this is actually a twofer. So you'll see that there's the book on the top, but look below it, and you'll start to see a... Um, a set of, um, you'll start to see an arch and then a gateway. 
that's actually our little Easter egg for a symbol that we're going to get to in just a second. So this is actually a two for stone. But I wanted to show this as an example of one of the books that we have here in the library. So uh, books can represent the Bible or it can just simply mean knowledge. And if we're looking at the book that I have been reading uh, lately, which is Stories in Stone, A Field Guide to Cemetery Symbolism, uh, that this book, just like many other books, is somebody uh, who could be uh, very much a, a reader or a person who, who holds learning uh, very, very highly. That's another symbol for a book. Um, it's also a book that can register the deceased deeds on earth, because remember, we do have the symbolism of St. Peter sitting at his ledger when somebody comes up and looking to see if they're on the naughty, naughty or nice list, depending on what's on their um, on the deeds that they performed on earth. Um, so you do have that a little bit of symbolism as well. Now, a broken column um, can represent a lot of different things. So just as symbolism, people find the symbolism in clouds. Sometimes people find symbolism in, um, in different images in uh, this time period. So we're taking a look that the broken column can often mean that is a life that has typically been cut short um, or it is a life that has been cut in, uh, cut short by a tragic accident. So you will see uh, with the column and Agoras, you, this isn't just in a symbolism in a headstone, but it's also the symbolism of an upright stone that may be a broken column. And I've got a good example of that to show you. So here's another one, which is clasped hands. So you will see this and notice if we look at the, the symbol on the left, that um, you'll see a woman's blouse on one side and a man's cuff and button um, on the right. So there are some connotations that if one hand is slightly higher than the other will designate that somebody passed before the other spouse. Um, but in some instances, it just means that uh, either this is uh, a spouse uh, or spouses who have been reunited in death. But in the case of Andrew Ingalls, who we saw a little bit earlier, he has grasped hands on his headstone, but he was not married. So it's also a connotation of somebody being welcomed into the afterlife um, and really adhering to that idea that of the good Christian death, that um, this person is going to accept death willingly and with an open heart, and then someone will be there to welcome them into heaven. Now, remember when we talked about our book just a couple of slides ago, and we're looking at something of uh, some symbolism that yes, it had our book on it, but this is the more interesting bit to me. This is the gates ajar. And you'll see this, this was like super popular um, starting right after the civil war. And you still saw the gates ajar uh, being a super popular image all the way into the 1940s. So this is a super cool, super amazing story um, that uh, the gates ajar is actually uh, the, is actually imagery that came about because of a best-selling Christian book. So the Gates Ajar, published by Elizabeth Stewart, Stewart Phelps in 1868, was the Christian twilight of its time period. So everybody read this book. It was like one of the best-selling religious novels of the 19th century. And she made, it was so popular, she made three of them. They, she was like a trilogy, kind of like Twilight, I think, at four. But, but she had a trilogy of these books. She could not stop writing them. And part of the story of the Gates Ajar jars because of the overwhelming death and grief of the amount of people who were passing in the Civil War. So in this instance, um, Elizabeth Stuart Phelps, she had lost not only her mother, um, her stepmother and her fiance, um, but she had also just because of this grief and of all those deaths happening very, very quickly, um, she wrote this book about a young woman who experiences a death of a brother and how she starts to visit this older aunt who has a little girl. And over the book is a series of conversations between the, the character and then the aunt and how through them talking through their grief, uh, they're able to kind of reconcile with all of this loss that they've experienced. And the aunt says something to this, uh, this effect where she said that, um, that the, the loved ones that we love never really leave us when they go to heaven, that uh, it's not a door that's closing uh, for good. It, the gates to heaven are ajar 
and that that person who has passed can pass through those gates whenever they need to, to provide you with comfort, to provide you with, um, to provide you with connection, to provide you your life with help you answer some of the questions you've been dealing with. So the dead can pass freely through the gates of heaven because the gates are ajar. And if you can feel that imagery and that how it had to be so comforting knowing that death is not the end, that that person can nip into your life at any time and help you through a terrible situation, um, you can see why the gates ajar then had a spinoff of merchandising. And this merchandising was to make cemetery symbols um, or cemetery carvings of the gates ajar. But people liked the old imagery as well. So they liked the books. They liked the crowns. They liked the doves. They liked uh, some of the trees or the flower symbolism. So the gates ajar is often just the, the, just the main focal point, but there's all of these other symbols that go with it. So when you see a gates ajar, know that you're seeing the merchandising opportunity out of a best-selling book. And that's why I, this is, has to be one of my favorite uh, images in our, in, our, in our tour today. But the other one we're gonna take a look at is pointed fingers. And no, I'm not meaning the finger that, that makes people offended and hurts their feelings, okay? We're talking about typically an index finger. So pointer finger. So the um, remember that the finger pointing up is what we see as somebody is going to heaven. Um, the pointing down um, is sometimes God reaching for a soul, or this is the hand of God coming down to reach for the soul. Um, it does not mean a downward finger does not mean this person is um, in any way of uh, sentence to a life of or an afterlife of damnation. That is a, that is a, um, that is a, a, a very consistent misconception. It can mean, however, an untimely, sudden, or unexpected death. Um, so I often kind of look at that and say, those images will often be coupled with other symbols. So for example, I have here a downward finger with uh, chains that have been broken. And this is a symbol that actually comes from the medieval period. Um, many people, for, uh, Christians from that time period believed that the soul was tethered to the body by a gold chain. And when that chain is broken, the soul has been released to heaven and the, and the chain collapses to earth and to dust. So when you see a finger pointed downwards uh, and a sudden untimely death, and that this soul has now been sent off into the afterlife and the chain is, is breaking down into dust. So you'll see those symbols as well. Now there's also too the, um, the, the finger on a book which has a couple interesting symbols. So this is might be that the person is learned. It might be a representation of the Bible, but also studiousness. That in a different types of portraiture throughout time, people who have typically had a finger in a book or on a book, um, in the example that we we'll see on our, our imagery today, um, that that person was very learned. So there's multiple connotations with that symbol. I always tell people to see if there was any research that individual to see if there was something that could support any of those other symbols as well. But also um, fingers pointing up and then stars around it. So stars could also mean military service. So there's a lot of different symbols. There's with these, with the fingers, there tends to be multiple symbols kind of layered on top, like a, like a sandwich or on an ice cream sundae. Uh, roses. Very, very popular. One of the most popular symbols that you'll see in cemetery symbolism are roses, um, basically because they're associated with the Virgin Mary, the rose without thorns. It's also a huge symbol of uh, that Victorian uh, custom of people bringing flowers to a house because of a wake. You weren't sure when that person was going to be buried, so you would bring uh, typically very fresh smelling or very strong smelling flowers into the house to help keep the smell of the decomposition down. Uh, but also that people will also leave um, a lot of flowers um, through major rites of passage. So when somebody has a baby, people send flowers. When people get married, they have flowers. When they die, they have flowers. So roses tend to be a, a big 
long lasting symbol in our um, that we inherited from the Victorians. Now with the symbolism of flowers, it can change over time. So in the case of our baby stone on the left, you'll see a broken bud. And that is normally a child who's under 12, can be a child also under the age of one, that you'll see a broken branch or a broken, uh, broken bud of a flower that hasn't bloomed. Flowers that are in partial bloom, and you do see these, are typically teenagers or teenage girls specifically. And then a full bloom flower will be a woman typically in her mid or early 20s, sometimes into her 30s, uh, that designates that she died in a time of life. Um, and then what you'll see on a full wreath of flowers is sometimes uh, a, a general decoration of of um, fidelity or love or everlasting love um, and everlasting uh, everlasting uh, love for the person who's passed. So there's a lot of really great symbols here. And sometimes you'll see multiple flowers, but for the most part, roses tend to be a really, really big one. These are interesting, uh, the sleeping babies, especially the sleeping baby in a half shell, which was super popular uh, for a short period of time. Now, infant mortality is very different today than it used to be. Um, infant mortality is, um, has remained and remained quite high until we had some of our modern scientific advancements or medical advancements to be able to save lives of more children from more common, uh, common everyday uh, occurrences. Uh, but for the most part, what we see in the late 19th century is not necessarily seeing that a child is dead as far as a child is sleeping. Um, and that's where we get the rise of uh, baby and a half shell, which was super popular starting in about 1908 and went until about uh, 1920. So the end of the first world war, you start seeing baby and a half shell. Baby and a half shell is that the baby is the pearl of the oyster, uh, but also the shell itself is an is a early Christian symbol for Christianity or of, of Christ and Christ's protection of 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 what's inside. Um, so you'll see sleeping baby in a half shell. If you're really, really lucky, the shell hasn't been damaged or destroyed in like in our example today. Um, but baby in a half shell typically uh, came in, I think, four or five different sizes. You could send away for it through mail order. Um, and it was just to demonstrate that the baby is sleeping protected by the love of, of God. So a really, really interesting, very short lived headstone. If you see it, uh, make a mental mark of it, because um, especially if the shell hasn't been damaged. White bronze, my personal favorite. I had to say, like, if I was if I was looking at those arrangements, white bronze probably would have been a pretty good bet for a lot of people. Number one is that because it's made uh, technically out of zinc that resembles granite, um, it holds up against the elements exceptionally well. It's light; you get a lot for your money. And the panels on the sides of the uh, bronze monument actually can be ordered and then screwed in. So super, super popular in the 1880s, all the way up to the First World War. Um, unfortunately, our wartime, because we were going through a bit of an economic crisis before uh, America joined the Great War in 1917, uh, we actually used a lot of our metal went into making things like guns and tanks and flamethrowers, not so much into making uh, headstone monuments out of zinc. Um, so we didn't actually see a replacement for these um, after the First World War, which is a little unfortunate because you did get a lot of bang for your buck. Now, the cool thing about these is that actually bootleggers came to really, really love and appreciate these headstones. I'm sure for different reasons than what you and I would. Um, but they, what they could do is that they could actually fix those little panels because the panels were hollow behind it. They could actually affix a small hinge and you could actually make a, a fairly strong hinge and then place a platform, um, as you'll see at the bottom, it's just empty on the inside of the marker. So they actually could build in a little uh, table or a small shelf, and you could actually leave your bottles of alcohol uh, in there and then just have people leave their money, take their bottle and then take off, or it was a good swapping point out. So these headstones were typically really, really targeted by bootleggers, especially out here in Chicago, um, Westmont, a couple other cemeteries that had these. Um, and you saw a lot of damage to these over time because people actually realized what was going on and, and, and were damaging them or pushing them over or uh, taking them out temporarily and never replacing them. Uh, but these are really, really, really cool markers 
markers. So if you uh, if you had a chance to see some of these um, and you go through them, you'll see that they've st stood the test of time beautifully and they've done exactly as they were marketed. There's no biological lichen or green bacteria on them. They look just as perfect as they did um, in 1880. So on your marker that you occasionally you'll find portraits inside your markers. And these were super, super popular. Um, and when we start looking in about the 1880s um, onward, you'll start to see more and more portraits in headstones. If we were not taking a virtual tour of our little cemetery today, I would typically refer people to the Bohemian National Cemetery in Chicago to take a look at the pictures or the portraits that are inside those markers. Um, they've really, really, they're pictures that are printed on porcelain and that's why they've stood the test of time so beautifully. They can be outside in the elements and provided that um, they're secured well and they're, um, they're they really can stand up to a lot of different changes in the weather and temperature. So in the instance of on the left of the class tree with the uh, class hands with a tree and a portrait with garlands, this was a really over the top headstone, um, at least for the woman who was uh, buried there originally, um, Fanny, um, her, uh, this is part of that that a return to nature movement, which happened in the 1880s through about 1909. So you start seeing these faux wood uh, headstones kind of pop up all through cemeteries. And in this instance, uh, they offer, they also added some garlands, some flowers, the class cans, and then a picture of Fanny up at the top um, as she died in 1899. So it was certainly, um, certainly a standout show up piece that would have cost quite a bit of money. It was really an expensive headstone. And then underneath of it is, um, is her, is her husband, which who passed in 1920. So a little bit, a little bit later for her, but her picture's up at the top. Unfortunately, we don't have one of her husband. So let's walk from the old section of the cemetery into the new section of the cemetery. And um, some of our modern headstones that we're starting to see as we walk through, um, we're starting to see the symbolism has changed. Some of the old symbols are still there. So you'll still see a lot of angels. Uh, you'll see a lot of um, symbols of, of imagery of crosses, of garlands, of roses. But you'll also start to see more popular things of what people felt were important or a symbol that is a lot to them. So for example, we have a gentleman who has a semi truck on his headstone and another person who has a dolphin. So it could be that this person was a truck driver or just really like trucks. And for the case of the dolphin, maybe they were, if they were not involved in the ocean, they just really like dolphins. Sometimes there isn't a deep seated symbol um, in modern headstones, somebody sometimes that was something that meant a lot for them. It's a symbol of something that was really, really important to them. Now, one thing you will see in our modern headstones too is extra information that you didn't know about the people before. So for the example of all three of these, what do they have in common? And I'll actually give people just a second to take a look at these three things. What are the, what's the one thing that kind of brings all these three, three things together? And it's the marriage dates. So this has become a common practice in headstones to put the marriage date of the individuals who are buried there. You know, I'm as a genealogist in uh, my, my life, my work life, and as a librarian in my work life, I wish more headstones in the past had had that little, you know, married on this date uh, part, portion of their headstone because that would have made my life a whole lot easier. Uh, with that in mind, this is something, a trend that will probably continue uh, this started in the 1960s and is probably going to continue for a, a little while longer until we start seeing more of these upright headstones go away and people start either choosing a natural uh, burial or maybe just a crematory um, sort of option. Um, and as headstones start to kind of uh, move away, uh, we're probably going to see this trend of a marriage date um, at least stick around for a little bit, while longer. So let's do a little scavenger hunt since you guys have learned so much about cemetery symbols and symbolism. Let's go through some symbols that you may know, some symbols that you don't know, and let's kind of take a look and see if your eagle eye can kind of see the symbols that are here. So I'm going to kind of skip over the hands because you guys have pretty much gotten the whole hand lecture and, and you guys are probably doing really great. You're like, I don't ever want to see a pointed finger again. 
fair enough. Um, so what we will start with um, is the second row with the objects and animals. So we have a sheath of wheat. That means either a, a life that's well lived or a long lived life or a life that's been brought into harvest. Uh, that weeping willow tree, again, some of the oldest iconography we have in headstones. A cross, uh, a lamb, a dove, and an Our Father, which is a, another nod to uh, Bible. So under the flowers and plants, these are pretty cool. You guys will recognize under number 12, you guys will recognize the rose that's there. Next to it is a daffodil. No, it sounds weird. You have to really look at it and look at the petals and look at the, the middle of the flower, but it is a daffodil. Number 14 is a calla lily. Number 15 is a lily of valley. 16 is a Scottish thistle which you do see on, on the headstones of people from Scotland or people who immigrated from Scotland. And then 17 is a morning glory. So those are really cool. Sometimes call uh, the trumpets of God sometimes, but morning glories are, are, are gorgeous, wonderful flowers. And then here we have on uh, number 18, I told you that an upside down torch was gonna come into play, but there's multiple things here. So let's break it down. So we have the urn in the middle uh, with the drapery. So all of those are some of those older neoclassical themes of mourning. Then you have the upside down torch. And that means if the torch is extinguished, it's a, typically a symbol that somebody has passed. If they're upside down and still burning, it means that the soul is still burning um, brightly in heaven. So we have multiple themes there. Number 20, we see a number, another one of those crooked fingers with the chains. So that is a life that has been cut short and that the, the, uh, the gold chain uh, between the soul and the body has been cut as well. And that, that chain is now dissolving into dust. And then now we have 19, and this is cool. Take a look at this with your eagle eyes. So this headstone here, is the column broken on purpose or is it broken because of an accident. It is broken on purpose. So it was designed to look like a broken column. And how do we know that is because we're able to look at the top, it's kind of jagged, and then we're able to check out that chain and the chain is broken in the back. So I wasn't gonna show you that one, but the chain is broken in the back. So this is again, a life cut short and um, sometimes by an accident or some other sort of uh, disaster. And then now the soul, uh, the, the chain has been broken as well. So the, the soul has been untethered from the body. So I hope that you guys, if you want to learn more about headstones, please go through and check out the National Association of Cemetery Preservationists. I, there are a lot of amazing cemetery preservationists here in Illinois. Uh, there's a whole program here at the state of Illinois, which we hope that you'll uh, you'll go through if you're interested in cemetery preservation, and uh, especially if you're looking for an opportunity to get outside and do more. Uh, there's a lot of really great cemeteries that could use a lot of help, not only with cleaning, but um, with fixing and repairing stones. So you can also refer to Billion Graves or Find a Grave, really, really great websites if you're interested of getting outside and taking more pictures of headstones that look particularly interesting. Um, there's a couple of books and a couple of guides I recommend. You can just screenshot this and use this whenever you like. Um, but and uh, pick up the book that I have at my library, Stories in Stone, a field guide to cemetery uh, symbolism and iconography. So it's one of my little go-to guides that I check out to people when they're getting ready to go outside and hit the cemetery on a road trip or they just want to learn more about the cemetery that's down the street. This is always my number one go-to. I had to put that on hold just for you guys. So apart from that, we wanted to say thank you so much for tuning in to our first history happy hour. It's a recorded happy hour, but we promise we have some really great programs coming up in November and December. Uh, please check out our website, Illinois State Historical Society, and don't be shy. We want you to become a member. Be cool, join us. Even if you have a couple of don't want to become a member, we completely understand not everybody is a joiner and not everybody wants to get stuff, cool stuff in the mail and doesn't want to go to cool events. But why don't you drop us a couple of dollars? We always appreciate donations and uh, your donations really mean a lot to us. So thank you so much for joining us today for our Cemetery Symbolism uh, program. And we really, really hope to see you at our next History Happy Hour. We want you to have a great day and have a great Halloween. And we hope to see you really soon.